So I'm on, right? Can you hear me? Oh, perfect. OK. We had acknowledgments a moment ago. I think it's time we acknowledge him a little bit. So how about a standing O for the awesomeness fest and how awesome it's been? Thank so, you. Now, take that in. I am. Stay standing. You're welcome to sit now. If you felt that this was not an awesome experience and you, you don't admire Vision because it wasn't, admi it wasn't a good experience, but you admire him actually, even, even if it wasn't a bad experience, this is a long sentence, um, <laughs> because you appreciate his courage and his team's courage for doing something as audacious as the Awesomeness Fest. So stay standing if you just appreciate his courage. Yeah, okay. So, even if he had flubbed up and his team had done a terrible job, which they've not done, this has been an awesome experience, you'd still love him. But more importantly, would you love him if he actually hadn't done this at all? Stay standing if that's the case. All right, well. So, thank you, thank you, Thanks. thank you. I really appreciate it. Just one more, one more hand for, for Vishnu. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. If there's a message in there, yes, thank you. Um, if there's a message in there, it is that we have a tendency to get wrapped up in our identities as human doings. When in fact, as you, all of you st stood standing, telling us that even if he'd flubbed up, and this was not Awesome Fest, this was the, you know, uh, a, a different kind of fest, <laughs> um, or if he hadn't even tried, but you appreciated him for who he was as a human being, he'd still be worthwhile. And one of the things we need to learn in our lives, especially those of us who strive and strive and strive a lot, and I'm one of those, is that we are lovable for just being a human being and not for being a human doing. So my talk today uh, is going to actually re revolve a little bit about humanity, what I've learned about it in my, my few years on this planet, I just want to say a big acknowledgement to Sean, though. Um, Sean, I'd never heard you speak in person. I'd never actually seen you on YouTube. I've now watched you on YouTube with your dance party, uh, which I did while I was down here. You reminded me, I'm writing a book right now, a new book called Emotional Equations. And you just reminded me that, in your exact words, emotions are the currency that connect us as humans, no matter what our size is, what our language is, uh, what our gender is what our age is. I'm an old man relative to most of you in the audience. I'm 50 years old. I just turned 50 a month ago. Uh, and uh, I have a grand, I have three grandkids. One of my grandsons is 6'4", 200 pounds. We play basketball together. This is up here for me here on stage because, <laughs> because I was hanging out, figuring out what I was going to say. And Renee and Isabella were out there fetching me because it was 10 o'clock and I was reading and I said, wow, I'm sort of the white, you know, I'm the opening act for Srikamar Rao who's older than me. Um, but <laughs> um, so this is for Srikamar and me is to have our rocker. But I'm going to get out of my rocker and say, uh, we're here to get out of our rockers and to say that age is just one of the ways we can actually define ourselves. Um, for me, I, you know, I, uh, I started my company, and I'll talk about that today a little bit, uh, more than a half a life ago, or about a half a life ago, um, 24 years ago. I've been a CEO for 24 years until I sold my company about six months ago. In fact, six, six months ago today, I sold my company to a billionaire whose father started Hyatt, a guy named John Pritzker. Uh, his father was Jay Pritzker. Uh, and he took a majority stake in the company, and after 24 years of being a CEO, I stepped down to actually now be, or actually stepped up to becoming executive chairman of the company, which is giving me more time to write and speak, and to go out and tell you about the mistakes I've made in the last 24 years, because part of the thing that does come with age is experience and wisdom and a certain amount of scar tissue uh, that actually, scar tissue from life and business, uh, and that's what I'm going to share with you a little bit today. So. Um, 
I want to make sure I don't, didn't forget something there. No, that's, that's, that's how I want to get started. I want to actually start, though, with a little story because um, a couple days ago, um, is Mike here? Yeah, so my, my Vision's partner, Mike, um, is here. And a couple days ago, uh, got up in the morning, was going to go for a run, then went out and looked at the beach and saw, wow, that's a beautiful beach, but it's not that long. It's got sort of volcano lava on, on either end. And I, instead of actually going and running on the beach, instead I went into the gym and I worked out in the gym. And I actually ran on, even on the treadmill in the gym, which is the most stupid thing to do in Costa Rica. Um, <laughs> uh, and then, and then, and then Mike came out back from a run and he was all sweaty and he was, you know, he's, he's younger and fitter than I am. And uh, he told me that he, he also saw the beach was pretty short. So he went running on a country road. And later that day, he asked me, do you want to go running? We didn't go running. Um, we, had, we had lunch yesterday. But what was interesting yesterday that I learned in the morning, and it's very relevant to our talk today, is that beach, which is rather small and limited in terms of how much I could run back and forth, is much, it's like our, it's like our brain, actually. I don't know how many of you have actually gone beyond the lava, the lava, the lava um, uh, rocks to the south. You know you're going to the south when you go left. One, a couple people. So a woman named Sharon. Is that Sharon back there? So this is Sharon. I actually ran into her this morning. And I, I ran into Carol uh, yesterday. Well, if you actually go walk out to the beach and take a left, you'll think that the beach ends. It's just that beach ends. There's another beach. You actually go around the corner, and it's gorgeous. It is a, about a, maybe a two-mile, three-mile-long beach with a river that also can actually stop you in your tracks if you wanted to be stopped in your tracks. In my case, I took off my shoes because I was actually running with shoes on the beach, and I said, what the hell am I got my shoes on on the beach? I'm going to keep running and just run without my shoes. So I ran yesterday morning. I ran this morning. That experience of looking at life as the beach in front of you and the limitations of volcanic rock on either side being what you can do or what you can be, because as I said today, it's not all about being a human doing, it's about being a human being too. Those limitations are those that you set on yourself without me having the courage to say, okay, I'm going to go around the corner. It didn't take a lot of courage. It just took a lot of curiosity to say what's around the corner I was able to actually see a spectacular beach. And if I can be the wise sage in my rocker today, for you, if nothing else you learn today is that there's a better beach just to the south, I suggest you stray south, and that's what you'll learn from me. So in the 21st century, I think leadership is all about straying south, or straying, learning how to stray, learning how to actually be off the path of what's most obvious to you and in front of your face. So one of the things, how many, you know, all of us learned at a young age how to count. Uh, we learned how to count. One of the things we were not taught in school is what to count. We were taught how to count, but we weren't necessarily taught what to count. In the 20th century, leadership was all about learning how to count and we used to count some things that were not as important as they are, as what is important today. I know this is a little abstract. I'm going to make it a lot more clear in a couple minutes. But if I could ask you to think today that I'm going to help to reteach you how to count and more importantly, what to count. Um, that's what we're going to do today over the next hour or so. But first I have a question for you. What's the most neglected fact in business? What's the most, raise your hand, and, and people, thank you, good job, <laughs> it was that class you were in this morning, it just, it, 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 those brain cells, the most neglected fact in business, in my opinion, is that we're actually all human, we are humans w doing work with each other, and that gets lost in spreadsheets, that wasn't something I was necessarily taught at Stanford Business School, uh, and it's actually something that we all can actually rem are, Use a, we, one of the things that's most interesting in the business world today, relative to when I went to Stanford Business School and graduated in 1984, 
is there's a guy named Daniel Goleman. Have you heard of Daniel Goleman? He's written a book, couple books on emotional intelligence. Fascinating statistic. Two-thirds of success in business today is not related to your IQ or your level of experience. It's, re level, it's related to your emotional intelligence. Two-thirds of success in business today is emotional intelligence. One-third is those other two things, IQ and your level of experience. So knowing how to connect with each other, knowing the emotional currency that we have with each other, and how to actually spend that currency is really important. So let me tell you a story. Um, so this is Van Quash. She's from Vietnam. Uh, in fact, like Vision, Vision actually, when he was actually working uh, at that company in New York, had, or is it in New York or in Dallas? You had to change your name to Vincent. Where was that? On oh, San Francisco, even. So but you're on the phone with people. So he had to change his name to Vincent because he wanted to fit in and because he was on the phone with people and, and vision was harder for people to understand in America. Van changed her name to Vivian. And she came to, came to San Francisco in 1986. Uh, and her first job was working in a broken down no-tell motel. Do you know what a no-tell motel is? <laughs> oh, you do. You're nodding way too wet. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, okay. Well, there's this little place in San Francisco called the Caravan Lodge. And very few, any of you here from San Francisco at all? It's amazing, only like one or two of you. So, so there's Caravan Lodge was this sort of infamous little motel. Um, it was the kind of place where people, it was very popular at lunchtime. Um, <laughs> you understand what I mean? It was an hourly motel and you walked into the lobby and the nightly rates were, were posted $49 a night and then in a slightly smaller font, the, the hourly rates are posted, $20 an hour. So Vivian was working in this little motel in 1986, and she'd been working there for three months when I actually bought this motel. On my 26th birthday, I made an offer to buy the, but the motel. Um, it was in bankruptcy and foreclosure. It was in a terrible neighborhood. And December 31st, 1986, we closed escrow. And I went out and raised a million dollars because I'm not from a wealthy family. And I got to meet Vivian. Actually, it's funny. My first day in the business was actually January 1st. It was the night after New Year's Eve. New Year's Eve, the, the place was rocking. It was like, it was very popular. Um, and the next day, it was like a mess everywhere. And then for the next week, there was like no guests. <laughs> I was like, uh-uh, I'm in trouble. How am I going to make this work? But I got to spend time with Vivian and the staff. There were 13 people on staff, the total staff, 44-room motel. And I called my company Joie de Vivre. And Joie de Vivre means what? Joy of life in French. That's what I was looking for. Quite frankly, I'd gone to Stanford Business School. I was a type A person. I was very aggressive. I was going to go out and take on the world. And I graduated from Stanford Business School at age 23. which was very young to graduate from Stanford Business School. And my job out of business school, I hated and so within two years, I was like, I can't do this anymore. And I had a midlife crisis in my mid-20s, um, sort of like, sort of like Lisa. Um, didn't you have it? Is it your mid-20s? No. Um, yes. Kim, 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 Kim. Yes, Kim. Did you have, did you have your midlife crisis in your mid-20s? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was 21. Well, that's really that's early 20s. Get it over with. Yeah, exactly. So I... I I had this midlife crisis at age 25, and I just said, I, I, don't want, I want to love what I'm doing. And so I started this company. I, just, I called it Joie de Vivre for myself, Joy of Life. Uh, it was a, not a practical name, not easy to pronounce, not easy to spell. Not everybody knows what it means. Um, but it actually defined the business that I wanted to create. I wanted to create Joy of Life for our employees and our customers and for myself. What I learned as I spent time with Vivian, the housekeeper, she was a housekeeper, a maid in this no-tell motel, I renamed the, the hotel The Phoenix, rising from its own ashes. Um, and what I learned in spending time with Vivian is that she had sort of a joie de vivre, a joy of life, in being a maid. How is that? That made me very curious. How could someone actually have joy in actually cleaning a toilet for a living? And what I started to learn from Vivian was it wasn't that the a task of cleaning a toilet was what gave her joy. And in fact, in life, I will tell you, life, when it comes to, when I, one of the things we learn in life, 
is you have one of three relationships with your work. You either have a job, a career, or a calling. When someone has a job, they're cleaning toilets. Or they're doing whatever the set of tasks are that are resp they're responsible for in their eight hours of work, ten hours of work, however long they're working. When someone actually moves beyond the task and looks at the purpose or the impact of the work that they're doing, it, becomes, it moves to a career or to a calling. And if you, have a, have you, if you have work that actually depletes you, it's probably a job. If you have work that actually energizes you, you do your eight or ten hours of work and you're just pumped, then that's probably a calling. So as I started to spend time with Vivian and the other staff there, I realized that Vivian wasn't all excited about cleaning toilets. She was excited about the relationship she created with other employees as well as the relationship with our customers. Because you see, Vivian was from, from Vietnam. She didn't, ha she didn't have a whole lot of family with her in San Francisco. Most of the community she knew was back in Vietnam. So she was creating new community in San Francisco with employees, and she knew what it was like for someone to be far away from home and a little vulnerable, like our hotel guests. And so she had a certain empathy that came for taking care of the hotel guests. So Vivian taught me a lot about this pyramid of job career calling. And the reality is if someone can actually have a calling cleaning toilets for a living, you probably can have a calling in whatever you're doing. So as I spent time, I, you know, I grew the company. Uh, we actually grew from being this little motel, this, the Phoenix, this rock and roll hotel. Came out, that's what, that was my strategy. Is the initial group of people that I went after to market to was the people that nobody else wanted. The Marriott and the Hilton did not want rock and roll bands. I did, I was 26. I was like, hey, cool. All the bands can come stay with us at the hotel. And all of a sudden, everybody from David Bowie to Linda Ronstead to R.E.M. to the Chili, Red Hot Chili Peppers to Nirvana started staying in my funky little motel called the Phoenix. That hotel, that motel, grew into Joie de Vivre. And Joie de Vivre ultimately grew to being, well, now we're the second largest in the, in the country. Um, but by year 2000, we were actually the largest hotelier in the Bay Area. We had 20 hotels. So I'd grown from one little motel to actually having 20 boutique hotels all around the Bay Area. Now in year 2000, that was a really good thing because between 1995 and 2000, the Bay Area was the place to be. It was the most rocking economy, micro economy, anywhere in the world because that dot-com boom was a major uh, help to anybody who had a business in the Bay Area. But in 2001, things changed for all kinds of reasons. The dot-com boom became a bust and then 9-11 happened, 9-11-2001. Well, 9-11 happened, and at, when 9-11 happened, did you want to jump on a plane anytime soon? No. And if you were from outside the U.S. trying to come in, Vishen told his story about just how immigration started actually putting up a big barrier. Well, guess what? It became harder to get people to come into the U.S. Uh, and in fact, uh, <laughs> there was, then there was a recession, and then... Oh, and then, yes, we, we went to war in the U.S. with uh, initially Afghan, Afghanistan, and then we went to Iraq. And when the U.S. went to war with Iraq, we sort of got into a little bit of a war with France. Now, I don't know how many of you are Americans here. Okay, a lot of you are. So you remember during that time, many Americans stopped eating French fries. Well, that's not true. We actually st we kept eating French fries. We just called them something else. What do we call them? Freedom fries. And we started boycotting French products. Now, what's the name of my company? Wow. Joie de Vivre. So I got these emails from Alabama and, I don't know, my hometown area of Orange County, Southern California, <laughs> saying to me, we're boycotting you because we're boycotting all French companies. And I write them back and say, wait a minute, we're not a French company. We're actually based in San Francisco. And I get a terse email back saying, oh, that's worse. Um, so I... <laughs> San Francisco is a bit like left of Paris. Um, so so um, I went from actually being in a place where I was the genius because all of my hotels were in the best hotel market in the country to being an idiot. Uh, because between 2001 and 2005, uh, San Francisco Bay Area hotels went through the largest percentage revenue drop in the history of American hotels since World War II, uh, other than from a natural disaster. So all of my hotels were in the bad market. So it was about that time that I ended up, so we, at that point I had 1,000 employees uh, and not very deep pockets. And 1,000 employees, not deep pockets, money running out pretty quickly. 
it was in October of 2001 that uh, on my lunch break, I ended up in a little bookstore around the corner from my office. And I went there initially looking for a business book, thinking, okay, I'm going to channel that energy I had when I was at Stanford Business School and try to remember some of that really good Stanford Business School wisdom so I can figure out how to make payroll next month because I could make payroll this month, but next month didn't look good. And within about five minutes, in the business, five minutes of time in the business section of the bookstore, I realized I needed something more serious. So I quickly ended up in the self-help section of the bookstore, um, which is where people go when they need sort of psychological uh, support. Um, and I came across a book by Dr. Abraham Maslow. How many of you have heard or are somewhat familiar with Abe Maslow's work? Okay, a good number of you. This is what he's best known for, his hierarchy of needs pyramid. Now, later in his life, he ultimately turned it into a seven-level pyramid. And Carol, are, Carol, are you here today? Carol's going to actually talk a little bit about that and how they actually line up with the chakras, the seven, the seven actual uh, levels of his pyramid. But what he's best known for is his five level pyramid. And in essence, for those of you who don't know it, the basic premise behind Maslow's hierarchy of needs is that whoever we are in life, we have some basic physiological needs. There are four. You will think there's a fifth, but there are really only four that you have to have. Water, air, food, and... Nope, not shelter. You can live without shelter. Sleep, not sex. Sleep. <laughs> Uh, some of you might have a fifth physiological need that you have to have, otherwise you'll die. But for most of us, there's just four. Uh, safety shelter is a step above that. There are people who have lived without caves. And so what I learned from Maslow was that I was a guy who started a company and called it Joie de Vivre. And in 2001, 2002, I wasn't feeling much Joie de Vivre. And I was, I was looking for that self-actualization. Because that's what Maslow said is at the top of the pyramid. People who in their lives are living the most fulfilled lives get to a place where they realize what their purpose on this planet is and it's quite unique to them. And I'll, I hate to use this, but there's an, there's an actual ad campaign that lasted 14 years in America by the U.S. Army that defines self-actualization, which is be all you can be. Be all you can be is the best definition I could ever give for self-actualization. So I was a person who wanted to be self-actualized at a time when I was full of fear. But I started asking myself, well, my company, and this, is, this is a hierarchy of needs for individuals, for humans. And my company, if, if, I'm not, if I don't have it wrong, is full of humans. <laughs> what if actually we applied this hierarchy of needs to how we did business? So initially we looked at it and said, what's the hierarchy of needs for our, our, our hotel customer? And ultimately, I turned Maslow's hierarchy of needs into what I call the transformation pyramid. Because there's really three key themes in Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Survival is your physiological and safety needs. Success are your social belonging and esteem needs. That's when you feel successful. And you feel in a transformative state when you're in a place of self-actualization. Survival, succeed, transform. This is the pair of glasses with pyramid glasses that I wear when I look at life today. And it's the pair of glasses I wore when I actually looked at how we were gonna remake our company at a time where we were either gonna reinterpret how we do business or we were gonna die. We were gonna go out of business. What was interesting is as we started to look at how we did business in 2002, 2003, we started to realize that in business as leaders, one of the things I was taught at Stanford Business School was to manage what you can measure. Have you ever heard that before? Manage what you can measure? It's sort of a basic premise in business is if you can't measure something, you don't know if you're having an impact on it. Does that make sense? Has anybody, anybody ever heard, it, heard it, a different version of that? Yes. What gets measured gets managed. Yeah, what gets measured gets managed. Yeah. Exactly. So same idea. What gets measured gets managed. What we manage, manage what you can measure. Well, what I started to see as a leader, as the CEO of a company, is that when we were measuring things, we were always measuring things at the bottom of the pyramid. Because what's at the bottom of the pyramid is easily measurable. Let me ask you for, for a second. Did you have breakfast this morning? No. no. For those who didn't have breakfast, you're going to have some physiological need problems soon. 
You will, and can you feel it? You can feel that you didn't have breakfast this morning. Okay. Our physiological needs are tangible. You know if you didn't sleep well. You know if you need some water. When you went to bed last night after you had a few drinks and you put your head on a pillow and if you asked yourself, was I self-actualized today? That's a much harder question to answer, right? Does that make sense? Well, that's true in business too. We can benchmark, and we did at Joie de Vivre back then, whether our compensation for our employees was comparable to other companies. But we didn't benchmark whether our employees had a sense of meaning and a sense of mission and purpose and whether they felt transformed and self-actualized in the workplace. And back in 2002, we started doing that. We started measuring things that people hadn't measured before. We started measuring what emotions our customers felt when they stayed with us. Very strange. We're actually, emo you know, the classic thing that a hotel does when they're actually measuring whether you like, had a good experience was, or not was, was your check-in efficient? Well, efficient check-in is like base of the pyramid as a customer. But if a customer had an awesome experience, it's probably top of the pyramid. So we start asking ourselves, how do we start measuring the things that are intangible in life? How many of you have seen that MasterCard commercial about, you know, what's uh, the priceless commercial? What's most important in life is what's priceless? That's what they're saying. It could be you as a husband, or a father or a, a, a mother buying Janie or Johnny a baseball bat and a baseball hat. But to actually see Janie or Johnny hit a home run is what's priceless. So there's some things in life that are priceless. The problem in business and in leadership is we tend to get so wrapped up in managing at the bottom of the pyramid what's tangible that we forget about what's higher up the pyramid. So I started actually doing some research on this. And I actually found a study that showed that 94% of business leaders around the world believe that the intangibles in their business, which are things like their company reputation, their ability to innovate, their employee engagement, their customer loyalty, their customer evangelism. I mean, we live in an era where customer evangelism with word of mouth, as opposed to word of mouth, is much more meaningful. In the word of mouth era, I would just tell anybody who is around me. In the word of mouth era, it's anybody who wants to read whatever I write on any website. So I started, what I saw is 94% of business leaders said intangibles are important. Do you know what percentage of business leaders also said they manage around the intangibles today in the 21st century? 5%. 94% said it's important, and 5% actually are actually measuring it. So, who's that? This guy knows how to manage intangibles exceptionally well. This is Steve Jobs back in the 1980s with the original Apple. This is Steve Jobs today with the air. What do you notice that's different beyond the fact that I'm trying to be Steve Jobs wearing black and, and, and jeans here, um, but beyond the fact that he's got gray hair now, what's different in these two pictures? Smiling. Well, he is smiling, that's true. He is in a happier place and maybe... What else? Wiser. Wiser, what else? Forget about him for a minute. What's different about the machines? What's that? He's more relaxed. But what about the machines? The size. That's true too. And guess what? On the left, it's all about the tangible. It's the hardware. In the 1980s, 80% 80 of the cost of a personal computer was in the hardware. And 20% was in the software. Today, it's the software. 80% of the value of a personal computer is in the software and not in the hardware. Today, intangibles are important. This is the most admired company in the world, according to Fortune magazine, and they focus on intangibles. And you've been nodding your head, so you, what's your name again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've worked for some of the best, and, 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 and you're, if you're at Pepsi now, right? And your, your CEO knows this. She's very good at this. She's, I'm very impressed with her. Pepsi gets it too. So, 
So I'm actually going out, so this is what I'm starting to look at. Now, this is a bit abstract. I'm going to bring it back to how it's relevant to you in a few minutes. But if I, my, one of my main points of today is the world of leadership in the 21st century has changed. It is no longer about managing what you can easily measure at the bottom of the pyramid. It's more important to actually look at what's the intangibles. Whoops, I'm, I went way too far there. So that is... Uh, I wrote a book called Peak. I'll tell you about it in a second. But this is three pyramids we're going to look at later. The employee pyramid at the bottom, customer pyramid at the top, investor pyramid at the middle. But there's something in the middle. I'm sorry, the investor pyramid on the bottom right. In the middle is a heart. And this is the business model we use to run the company. Because what, I, what a few Harvard Business School professors uh, wrote about called the service, service profit chain in the early 1980s is that if you can see it here, if you create a great culture in an organization, it tends to, that's number one on the heart, it drives employee loyalty. And if employees are loyal, I'm sorry, employee satisfaction. If employees are satisfied, that drives customer loyalty. And if customers are loyal, that drives and maintains a profitable and sustainable business. So I learned this from Southwest Airlines. Some of you are familiar with Southwest. For the last 40 years, by far the most successful airline in America, not even a close second. Uh, and this is how they do business. It's all about driving culture, because that's where the pump of the heart, uh, of, the, of the blood goes for the heart. And if it goes well, the heart actually beats, and it actually relates to everything else here. So you're going to see these three pyramids in a little while, so don't worry. So I ended up writing a book about this called Peak, How Great Companies Get Their Mojo from Maslow. Um, and, I, and my basic premise is that employees, once their basic money needs met, they have meaning needs. And we actually, as leaders, need to focus on what are those meaning needs and those recognition needs. Um, I love the idea of the, the sugar cubes as a, rec a means of recognition. Um, it's a great thing you could do in your company. Um, customers are looking for their unrecognized needs to be met. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, and then finally, investors. While most investors are at the bottom of the pyramid, they're just like, give me as much money as quickly as possible. There are a lot of investors who actually are looking to put their money where their heart is. So I started going out and talking about this because this book became a a big seller, and a lot of well-known companies started actually taking it on as part of their way of doing business. The person you're probably most familiar with is Tony, Tony Shea from Zappos, um, who has a book out called Delivering Happiness right now. Uh, he wrote the foreword for the book, and Zappos basically made this their embedded culture. This is how they do business. So, but as I was going out and talking with people about leadership in the 21st century, someone brought up an Einstein quote to me. And it was one that is like a bit of a mind tease. He's, this person in the audience raised their hand and without even looking at a piece of paper just cited this quote from Einstein. and said, not everything that can be, count, can, can be counted counts and not, every, not, and, and not everything that counts can be counted. It's a ton, tongue twister as well as a mind tease. What he's basically saying, this guy in the back of the room, and he sort of let, left me speechless for a moment, is, well, maybe we're not supposed to try to count the things that are most important in our lives. Maybe we're just not supposed to count those things because they're not actually countable. Well, that's a really interesting question. But as a leader and in business, I've learned if we don't count, if, if something actually isn't showing up, it may actually not be valued. And the fact we can't count it may mean we don't value it. And if we don't value it, it's not going to be part of our business plan. If it's not part of our business plan, we're just going to be managing at the bottom of the pyramid. All right, so that actually meant I started having this weird thought, like I need to go study someone who's done this better than anyone else. Who's the guru of the world to actually show me how to measure intangibles? I don't know. I, I, I Googled that and I didn't get anything. But what I did get was this guy. Very funny that we're here in Costa Rica right now. Costa Rica, according to surveys in the world right now, is the happiest place on earth. Did you know that? Okay. Yes, yes. So, Vision, thank you for taking, bringing us to the happiest place on earth. But 38 years ago, in 1972, no one measured the happiest place on earth. No one, you know, the happiest place on earth was Disneyland, supposedly. Um, but 38 years ago, there was this guy who was 17 years old, who was the new king of Bhutan. For those of you who don't know Bhutan, where Bhutan is, I'm going to show you on a map in a moment. 
But this new key is in Asia. So if you just need some, some general idea, it's near Nepal. It's right near, near where Tibet used to be, um, or Tibet still is, depending upon your politics. Uh, this guy was 17, and he became, he became uh, the uh, king of his country. So he was in India, right next door, uh, at age 17, uh, on a tour, talking about being the new king of, of Bhutan. And an Indian journalist raised his hand and asked him, what's your GDP? Or back then they called it GNP, your gross national product in Bhutan. And this king answered in a way that has basically changed how the world's been ever since. He said, off the cuff, why is it that we're so obsessed? Oh, honey, look at what you're wearing. Maga, woo! <laughs> wow, you have, to, you have to leave the room. That's too distracting. <laughs> Lisa, uh, yes, yeah, a hand for that. Well, you know what, is that, is that orange? Okay, I can't tell from back here because I'm slightly color blind and color dumb, but I, I was going to say, if you're wearing orange and black, those are San Francisco Giants colors. And my, I'm born in Halloween, so those are my colors too. So. Um, but back to Bhutan and India. So what he said was he said, why is it we're so obsessed with gross national product? Why aren't we more focused on gross national happiness? Now, the journalist chuckled and like, duh, like, like, like this 17-year-old this king from this Buddhist country, this like Buddhist economics. I mean, come on, this is crazy stuff. But for the next 36 years, this king, who stepped down a year or two ago uh, for his son to become king, actually spent 36 years preparing Bhutan to actually focus on how they can measure the intangible of happiness. And they actually started a movement that I'll talk about in a moment. So as I, I went to, so I decided to go to Bhutan. I'm a CEO, I'm going to Bhutan. I'm gonna leave my company for a week and a half I'm part of an organization called YPO, Young President's Organization, and I joined a YPO trip to Bhutan, which gave me the opportunity to learn about the Gross National Happiness Index. Because if there's any intangible that's hard to measure, it would seem to be happiness. Because happiness evaporates. It's not something you actually have and you can hold in your hand and say, I have happiness. Happiness evaporates. In fact, the more you actually try to clutch it, the more it actually probably goes away. So, I'm in Bhutan, and lucky enough to spend some time with the Prime Minister of Bhutan um, because I'm with YPO and they know they, they get all this access. So I'm sitting next to the Prime Minister at, at, a, at a dinner and I ask him, so how do you create happiness, especially if it's something that evaporates? This is like an intangible, how do you, how do you measure something that, does, that actually goes away? He said, we don't create happiness. He said, he's a very wise man, he says, we don't create happiness, we create the conditions for happiness to occur. Because no one can create happiness for someone else. But you can create the conditions. And Abe Maslow once said, uh, he taught, the reason that my book's called Peak is because Abe Maslow created the expression peak experience, which is what we're having for four days here. We're having peak experiences. Um, what Abe Maslow said is we can create the conditions for peak experiences to happen in our lives, or conversely and perversely, we can create the conditions for them not to happen in our lives. So what the, the Prime Minister of Bhutan said to me is, we create the conditions for happiness to occur. And he went on to tell me that Bhutan has all these ways of measuring happiness, measuring the conditions for happiness. And there's four key essential pillars, there's nine key indicators, and then there's 72 different metrics that they use to measure happiness in Bhutan. Like, let me use one example, because that may sound like, what, what would they measure? Well, one of the nine key indicators is, are people happy with how they spend their time? Are people happy with how they spend their time? Now, I promise you that the GDP index that we have, which is our primary definition for success in the world for countries, does not actually have anything to do with are we happy with how we spend our time. For those of us who are here right now, we are happy with how we're spending our time. But on a daily basis, if you ask yourself in the modern world, are you happy with how you're spending your time, most people would say no. But in Bhutan, they said that's one of the nine key indicators of how we create the conditions for happiness. And let's benchmark how people feel about how they're spending their time over time and feel and figure out how as leaders we can help them with that. So as I spent this time in Bhutan, it was fascinating. It was fascinating. I mean, it's not a perfect country and it's a relatively primitive country. It's definitely a developing country. 
but it is amazing for many different pur- for many different ways in terms of just the level of happiness that I saw there. And what I started to see was that there was what I call an emotional equation. That's the name of my next book. Uh, that that quote. Oh, I didn't give you the quote. I didn't you give you the quote from Mark Twain, did I? I'll give it to you later. Okay. So uh, I, I'm writing a chapter yesterday, and there's a Mark Twain quote that's great um, that sort of relates to this. But I'm writing this book called Emotional Equations. And so I started to see that there was an emotional equation that defined the Bhutanese, the people from Bhutan. So happiness equals wanting what you have divided by having what you want. I know that's hard to understand too. Let me explain it. Wanting what you have, think of gratitude. Appreciating what you have. Learning to actually appreciate gratitude, having gratitude in your life. That is what wanting you what you have means. Having what you want sounds like the same thing, but it's a little different. Having what you want is going out and gratifying yourself with something. Going out and pursuing something for gratification purposes. Does that make sense? I want to have what I want. I have a want, I need to go out and have it. So. The difference between wanting what you have is gratitude, having what you want is gratification. One of them is a practice, the practice of happiness, and one of them is a pursuit, the pursuit of happiness. The bottom of this equation is the pursuit of happiness. Now, I'm not going to actually beat up Thomas Jefferson right now. Um, Because Thomas Jefferson was the last leader in the world before the king of Bhutan to talk about happiness is a government goal. In the actual Declaration of Independence, Independence, he says, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, I don't want to say that America or places in the world that are pursuing happiness are actually getting it wrong. Because I am a pursuing kind of guy. I would not have graduated from Stanford Business School at age 23 if I was not a pursuing type A person. But I will say when it comes to happiness... Having practice of happiness in the numerator and the pursuit of happiness in the denominator will make you happier. Because if you look in the dictionary under the word pursuit, in some dictionaries, the way they define pursuit is to chase with hostility. Do we chase happiness with hostility? In many, in many cases we do. Just to stay, to stay up with the Joneses next door. Speaking of staying up with the Joneses next door, this is where Bhutan's located. Look who's next door. (laughs) 38% of the world's population is next door to Bhutan. Maybe Bhutan may have an impact on 21st century happiness with the growing middle classes in both India and China. But what I do know is that Bhutan's had an enormous impact on the fact that at this point, as of when I gave my TED talk in February, it was 40 countries. Now it's 52 countries. 52 countries in the world, not including the United States, are now measuring happiness as a means of determining whether they're getting it right as a government. And the most recent... (laughs) The most recent government to do this is David Cameron in England. And a lot of times people say, oh, all that happiness stuff, it's just all those liberals and all those, you're a San Franciscan, you'd like that kind of stuff. David Cameron's a conservative, and his Tory government in England is now measuring happiness. Uh, And there's a great book called Gross National Happiness by a conservative writer talking about how this is the most important 21st century uh, intangible that leaders can actually manage around. All right, so this is pretty abstract. And it's really interesting because even before the king of Bhutan in 1972 even started talking about this stuff, Robert Kennedy gave a speech in 1968, four months before he died. And I'm going to have to turn around to actually read this to you. But this is what he said in 1968. Too much and for too long, we seem to have surrendered personal excellence and community values in the mere accumulation of material things. Our gross national product counts air pollution and cigarette advertising and ambulances to clear our highways of carnage, yet the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short except that which makes life worthwhile. Wow, that's a mouthful. 1968. He was way ahead of the game. 
This is, if you to actually take current GDP, gross domestic product, and turn it into a balance sheet, this is what GDP counts. <laughs> this, these are the things that actually are, are from Robert Kennedy's speech. If you took Robert Kennedy's speech and turned it into a balance sheet, these are the things he mentions in, in the speech that are part of what GDP is, and these are the things he mentions in the speech that GDP doesn't count. Pretty different lists, huh? The left and the right. What I want to ask you is in your own personal life, do you have a balance sheet? Do you have a collection of things on the left and a collection of things on the right in terms of actually what counts for you, the tangibles and the intangibles? I'll come back to that. All right. But just again to get the, the, his final you know, part of the, that, that quote is, it measured everything in short except that which makes life worthwhile. Oh, not yet. Abe Maslow had a quote that you've heard before, but you had no idea it was Dr. Abraham Maslow who said it. Have you ever heard the quote, if the only tool you have is a hammer, everything starts to look like a... That was Abe Maslow. He said that to the psychology community because back in the 1940s, when he sort of started talking about the hierarchy of needs, the psychology community's approach to psychology was like that small beach in front of our resort here. They said, it's all about neurosis. It's all about worst practices in human behavior. As psychologists, we're going to study people who are broken and fix them. And Abe Maslow said, wait a minute, there's a much bigger world out there. There's people out there who have good lives and are fulfilled in life. And those people should be studied too because we can learn from best practices of those people and help the people who are not in a good place by learning some of those things about being fulfilled in life. And that was what self-actualization was about. So Abe Maslow said, in essence, we've been fooled by our tool. <laughs> Excuse the expression. Um, we've been fooled by our tool in that the tool we've used in the world as leaders, as country leaders, has been GDP as our definition of success. And in fact, GDP is really good at measuring tangibles. But do you know that today, there's three kinds of world in the world, there's three kinds of different industries you can be in. You can either be in the services industry, manufacturing, or agriculture. What percentage, and manufacturing and agriculture, they're very tangible. Services, a little more intangible, right? What percentage of the world's uh, economy today is in the service industry? 64%. The world is intangibles today. And yet we are using a means of measuring things that is way old. So the ultimate intangible in my business is Vivian. It's how Vivian treats our employees, our, our other our customers. Um, because you know what? Economists, I was an economics major in, in college. Economists measure things. You know, they're very good at measuring everything. They measure things in units of production and units of consumption. Did you ever, you know, any economics, econ economics majors here? Units of production, units of consumption. Well, the truth is, it's based upon the unit of production for Vivian is an hour of her work. But an hour of Vivian's work is not like an hour of most other people's work. And the way we measure things doesn't get that. This is Dave Erringdale. Dave Erringdale has stayed in the Phoenix Hotel, Vivian's Hotel. Vivian is still there 24 years later. Vivian's, Vivian and I have been working together longer than some of you have been alive. <laughs> um, Vivian, uh, Dave Erringdale has stayed in Vivian's Hotel 100 times in the last 20 years. And what he said to me about a year ago when I interviewed him, I started interviewing, I went out and I in interviewed the 100 customers in our company that actually have been the most loyal over all these years. I went out and talked to 100 customers, face-to-face -face or voice-to-voice, -voice, and I said, just tell me what we're doing right. Just like Abe Maslow says, tell me what we're doing right in life. And what he said is, it's all about Vivian. He said, Vivian makes me feel like I count. Vivian makes me feel like I'm in a home away from home. Vivian's way of treating me makes me feel like I'm in a habitat of happiness. And he used that expression, a habitat of happiness. It's like, whoa, okay, that's what the business I'm in. I'm not in the hotel business. I'm in the habitat of happiness business. So what's interesting, though, in the world of business, and just selling my company to a billionaire, 
and spending a lot of time going out and talking to private equity firms and venture capitalists and all of the kinds of people out there in the world who actually looked at wanting to buy our company or put a majority interest, put a, an investment in our company, is most of them don't look at things this way. And they're so silly because it, when it comes down to it, most people sort of look at things back to that heart, which we'll look at in a minute again. They say it's all about profitability. Profitability is measurable. Cash flow is measurable. But those are the outputs that happen once you've done the input first. The input is making people happy, making your employees happy, making your customers happy, and that actually leads to the profitability over a longer period of time. Why isn't it that the business world can see that you don't have to choose between inspired employees and sizable profits? In fact, inspired employees usually help create sizable profits. So I think what the world needs now is we need to actually rethink how we count. Re-ask ourselves, what are we counting? And what's most important that we can start counting in our own lives? So I want to tell you a quick story. Um, everybody's had some really poignant stories up here, and I guess I wasn't going to tell you this story, but I've decided I'm going to. Um, I'm a guy who talks about self-actualization, and uh, <laughs> called his company Joie de Vivre. My name's Chip. I live in San Francisco. I mean, I, I'm a cliche. I'm, <laughs> I'm a cliche for happiness. But a couple years ago, two or three years ago, I wasn't very happy. I was not in a good place. I was not in a good place partly because job career calling. I used to have a calling, which was being that CEO and going out and making my company like the best in the world at boutique hotels. But I was starting to realize that that calling that I used to have, gravity was occurring. And it was starting to become a career and more like a job. And what I really loved doing was going out and writing books and giving speeches and helping to make a shift in the world. Well, all that was happening, and a lot of other things were happening in my life. I had, you know, in a two-year period, a year-and-a-half period, five of my friends committed suicide, one of whom was named Chip, my best friend named Chip in the world. Uh, we were going to actually do a chip party in Costa Rica, of all things. This is my first time here, so it's been really interesting to be here. Um, and I, wasn't, I almost felt like I was going to join them, that, those five who committed suicide. I was not in a good place. And I was in my YPO group. They have a little forum, and you talk about what's going on in your life. And I said, you know, I'm, not in, I'm not in a good place. I'm thinking about car accidents. I'm dreaming about cancer. I am actually imagining that... I want my life to end this life because I feel so overwhelmed with the responsibility of running this company as we're going into another downturn. I did that last downturn, that dot-com downturn, and we did really well. We tripled in size after doing that peak stuff. And now we're doing another downturn. We're having like two once-in-a-lifetime downturns in the same decade. And I'm not built for this one. I feel like a prisoner. And so I, I started talking with my friends about it. And I started talking about all these things that could go wrong in my life and how it might be good if like some little problem happened so that I could sort of just no longer be CEO. Well, I ended up and had a relationship, an eight-year relationship that was ending uh, at the same time. And my son, my 34, who's now a 34-year-old son, uh, was wrongly accused to go to prison. He's now out. You know, he was exonerated. But long story short, everything was going wrong that could go wrong. So... Um, I, I went, there's a guy named Gavin Newsom who's now the, he's going to be the lieutenant governor of California. He was the, he, he's the mayor of San Francisco and he's a friend and he had his bachelor party at, at AT&T Ballpark, which is where the San Francisco Giants play baseball. Uh, and I went there and I hit a ball way out to the, uh, the warning track, almost a home run. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was like, I was 48 year old guy doing that. I'm like, whoa, whoa. And I tried to, but then I tried to run. <laughs> And I was running, 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 running the bases, and I decided I was going to slide into third base. I hadn't slid in three dozen years, and I didn't slide right. In fact, I wish I could see the, the photo of me sliding, and I broke my ankle sliding into third base. So, you know, I limped off. Uh, a w week later, um, my ankle that w was a broken ankle turned into a bacterial infection, and so I ended up hap and they almost had to amputate my leg in Montana at Gavin Newsom's wedding. Uh, and th so they put me on some antibiotics and they weren't working, so I was put on a stronger antibiotic. And then I was going to give, going on a speaking tour, which was not a good idea. I was going to Toronto and, um, I'm sorry, St. Louis, Toronto and Houston. 
I get to St. Louis, I'm taking a very strong antibiotic, and I'm on crutches, and I'm giving my first speech of six speeches in a three-day period. And I get up, and I'm feeling nauseous, and these antibiotics are supposed to create some nausea. And so I'm sort of like in a place of like, okay, I feel, I'm, exert, I'm nervous about the speech, and, but I feel a little bit nauseous and didn't notice it. At the end of the speech, I didn't feel well, and so I sat down, I was, because I was uh, uh, on crutches, and then they, people came up and I started signing books and I went unconscious in my chair, just like slumped in my chair. They got me on the ground. I was on the ground for about three minutes. I came to, had no idea where I was. Paramedics, uh, I went unconscious again, put me in a chair, unconscious again. Paramedics show up, heart monitors on me, put me in a gurney, I go flatline. Flatline, flatline, flatline. I died. I died. Um, and, I mean, not for a long time. <laughs> my, my heart came back about five to seven seconds later. But over the next hour, they had to have paddles out. They had to, like, say, this guy's got a problem. Long story short, they still don't know what it was. Two and a half years later. They still have no idea what it was. I call it divine intervention. Instead of cancer or a car accident, I had the wake-up call that said to me, what counts in my life such that I had to have that kind of wake-up call? So, um, I'll keep it at that. I have more I could tell you, but I'm going to keep it at that for now. What I'm going to actually say is I started counting things in my own life differently. I, you know, after that experience, I spent some time with my best friend, Vanda's boyfriend of 10 years, Frank, who's the world's preeminent authority on death and dying. He's really smart, really well known, and he goes out and he talks to people about death and dying. And he says the number one thing people want to actually say in, in, on their deathbed or want to know on their deathbed is, was I well loved and did I love well? So that's what I started measuring, love. How does that, how do I do it? In the form of how I actually spend time with friends. How do I spend time with friends? How am I spending t t time with myself? What are the things that I love in my life and how can I start counting that? So I hope that over the course of the next day, you'll actually ask yourself, go for a walk on the beach, go for a walk beyond the lava rocks. I'm going to read my Mark Twain quote here right now because it's a really great, great quote. He said, 20 years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than by the, thing, the ones that you did do. So throw off the bow lines, sail, sail away from the safe harbor, catch the trade winds in your sails, explore, dream, and discover. Now, let's apply for a moment how, can, how you can start counting in your business. I'm going to go through something that you saw earlier very quickly because I'm almost at the end of my time. You can start measuring things related to your employees higher up the pyramid. If you don't do a work climate survey, an employee satisfaction survey at least once a year with your employees, start doing it. Start asking your employees how they're feeling about their work. There's outside companies that can do that. Um, if you want to look for me at lunchtime or something, look for me and I can tell you some companies. You can do it yourself. Um, start measuring your turnover of your employees. That's something that a lot of companies don't measure very well. It's like employee turnover. Our employee turnover as a company is about one-third the industry average in our in industry. So that says something. People like staying. Um, customer pyramid. The, the baseline for the customers is their expectations need to be met and then their desires need to be met and then their unrecognized needs be, need to be met. Apple is successful partly because Apple customers are evangelists and they go out and tell the world. So ask yourself, how are you measuring yourself in social media, for example? And a year ago, I thought you couldn't. I thought there was no means of being able to go out and measure what people out there in the world are saying about your company on the internet. There is now. There's a company called Revenate in Palo Alto that actually has a tool that says, here's how you can actually measure your, measure your company, and it's called Revenate, and I have nothing to do with it as a company, but we use them, and it's just one way of measuring an intangible that in the past was not measurable. You can even actually start measuring things with your investors. I'm not going to spend any time on that because I don't have a lot of time. Or you can measure things with your community. You can ask, what are you doing to give back? How are you measuring? We measure our general managers in our hotels on their profitability, on their employee happiness, on their customer satisfaction. We also measure them on how much they give away to the community. And there's a minimum standard that every general manager at every hotel has to give away every year. Otherwise, they don't get a promotion. 
So we measure how we give back to the community at every different property. So in sum, um, life, is being, life is about being a human being, not a human doing. Uh, Mark Twain suggested we, we explore, we dream, and we discover. And if I can just remind you that at the end of the day, what counts and what I learned when I had my flatline experience uh, and I talked with the most wise man in the world about what people say when they're deaf and dying, is when people are on their deathbed, they don't ask their family and friends around them about all their successes, what they really want to know, and what really counts, and if there's a way to measure it, what would really count in their lives is knowing their scorecard for how they loved and how well they were loved. With that, I love you. Thank you for letting me to come up here and for joining you.